Welcome to the video. As you have seen in the title, today we are going to go over the research and the essay that I had to do for history and theory of architecture and engineering in my course at UCL, at the Violet School of Architecture. Park Crescent is a very, very, very interesting building. It ties with Palladianism and with ancient Greek architecture and that makes it really really unique. It is situated just in front of Regent's Park and has a lot of history which makes it super super unique. I really enjoyed researching about it so without further ado let's get into it. Along with the Napoleonic Wars which lasted until Waterloo's victory in 1815 and the Peninsular War terminating in 1814, the beginning of the decade was marked by a serious financial crisis. The British government did not prioritize the construction sector. Its spending on architecture, therefore, was eliminated, along with high taxes and shortages on imported building materials such as timber. This is why there was a high demand for housing due to the decreased level of building, which made decisive the financial boom that encompassed this Regency style. This resulted in a period focusing not just on the elegance of architecture, but in that of clothing and interior design among other forms of art. In 1811, Prince George was made Prince Regent and acting head of state. He wanted his own summer place and commissioned John Nash to create a master plan for a royal palace surrounded by parkland that would provide a circus of grand townhouses and palatial homes for the friends and family of the regent. At a young age, John Nash was articled to Sir Robert Taylor, a very important architect who served as sheriff of the city of London and left most of his considerable fortune for the teaching of modern languages at Oxford. He was inspired by Palladianism and therefore John Nash was influenced by this Italian school point of departure. In his book John Nash, Architect to King George IV, John Summerson describes Nash's time with Taylor as a good start in architecture. But architecture now and all through his life was for him only part of a much bigger, more ambitious and more regretting field of action. It was the whole field, not any one part of it, which engaged him. His mind was not formed for concentration on abstract problems of design. Neither architecture alone, nor engineering, nor finance, nor the law would have satisfied him, though he might have succeeded in all of them. It was not self-dramatization. The essence of his point of view was to feel the reins in his hand, not to see himself in the saddle. For Nash, the Regency period was golden and filled with excitement of command, since the talents of liberal but exacting patronage and the realization in the dust and toil of London of ideas were nobody but his own. The Prince of Wales was delighted by his architectural plans, calling the Regent's Park and its royal crescent the Yewel in the Crown, and saying in 1811 that Nash's plans will quite eclipse Napoleon. Regency architecture, therefore, constructed prioritizing the traditional white-painted stucco facade, along with Greek columns, pleasing proportions and mathematical orders. The British town was dominated by terraced houses and ornament, contrasting the modest Dorian middle-class houses. London was distinctly the most affected city by this classical revival. Being this decade the end of the British pioneer industrial revolution when Prince George was made Prince Regent and acting head of state due to his father's illness in 1810, there was an increase in laws to protect the British working conditions and employment. To maintain the standards of Georgian art and architecture, the man of taste of the 18th century was, according to Donald Pilcher, the self-imposed guide to the grandeur that was Rome, the glory that was Greece, and the more obscure preserves of the gloom that was Gothic, making style just accessible by the high social classes. 
Regency architecture, however, may taste manifestations no longer confined to a limited class, but to a wider circle of people due to the new ethical currents that made education, among others, reach more people than before. On a whole, after George III was succeeded by George IV in 1820, the aesthetic techniques of the correct taste involve prioritizing the picturesque facades of architecture as much as the tax on its materials. Due to the rapid commercial expansion and the changeover from craftsmanship to factory production, materials started to be produced in a new way. Mass production reduced the economical costs of ornaments, for example, by creating imitations in less amounts of time. Materials such as stucco were a substitute material for stone. At the same time, structural engineers widespread the distribution of materials and brought new roads and canals to the countryside, which made obvious the great impact the Regency period had in all the nation preceding the Victorian era. Bob Brumel and John Nash reigned together. When Brumel, an outstanding fashion designer of the epoch, brought in stark necked clothes, Nash brought back in stuccoed facades. He followed the fashion of joining the stucco surface and painting it in fresco to imitate bath stone, which is why Park Crescent is yellowish and not whitish. The new luxury development was located on the Crown Estate lands known as Marylebone Park, then renamed the Regent's Park. Marylebone was enclosed as a royal hunting ground for King Henry VIII, the father of the prince. Along with Buckingham Palace and the Brighton Pavilion, Park Crescent played a central role in the architectural career of John Nash. If it had been completed as a circus, it would have been the largest circle of buildings in Europe. In 1793, for the first time, the idea of developing Marylebone as a compressive and consistent unit was expressed. The Regency began in the year in which the park returned into the possession of the crown. George, Prince of Wales, was installed as regent in February 1811. In March, John Nash signed his first plan for the park. Before him, however, Thomas Leverton, the architect of Bedford Square, and John White, the architect of the Duke of Portland, present their planning ideas for the area. As Donald Filcher analyzes in his book The Regency Style, while White only used it hard as a decorative public building, both Nash and Leverton had more serious attempts at town planning and considered the economic side. A charge designed by Mr. White was to stand in the semicircle of ground embraced by the crescent. Nash, influenced by the realm of ancient Greece, changed the charge in the circus to the new road, a proposal which was relinquished since it was stipulated that no funerals or tolling bells should sadden the hearts of his tenants. Nash was eventually elected for the project although he had improperly made the report exclusively his own, ignoring that in official eyes he was in partnership with James Morgan, the engineer of Regent's Canal, as John Summerson noticed in John Nash, architect to King George IV. Nash designed a layout with reconciled approaches to the design of the Regency housing state. Barracks, markets and other necessary buildings are incorporated in these more comprehensive and natural layouts, which Nash referred to as the attraction of open space, free air, and the scenery of nature, with the means and invitation of exercise on horseback, on foot and in carriages, should, he decided, be preserved or created in Marylebone Park as allurements and motifs for the wealthy part of the public to establish themselves there. Nash stated that wealthy landowners preferred living near an open space, even if it was dusty and noisy, to live in quiet and unpolluted streets in the constructed part of the town. Therefore, a park where there are opportunities for riding, driving and walking was, he believed, an irresistible magnet, as he describes. 
I have always been of opinion that informing the Regent's Park, the buildings, should be considered as town residences, not country houses. Only we can expect the houses will be occupied by the higher classes. To effect this is the security of a contained and broken metropolis of streets and houses must be preserved. Park Crescent illustrates a complete unity of character and not an assemblage of villas. The Crescent is the central feature of the park. The Ionic Colonnades adjoining Portland Place, John Nash's most magnificent street in London, and the green in the middle make the perfect transition from town to park scenery. The new road, Marylebone Road today, was busy with traffic between east and west and this had to be distinguished in some way in order to merge fashionable mansions in the south of Portland Place with the new terraces of houses facing north. Street lighting had to be considered, as well as stands for hackney coaches, stations for watchmen, patrols, firemen and fire engines. Public spaces such as charges have to be near, and spots proper of direction of some great public edifice had to include statues or monuments in honor of persons who had distinguished themselves in the service of the country. Nash was focusing on Park Crescent as an organ in the city. The project was not just a building but one of the future main referenced coordinates of London, as Piccadilly or Oxford Circus are. It thus had to have the opportunity of selecting a higher class of tenants. In this way, as the park increases its beauty, it will increase in value, and the first occupants will stop the character of the neighborhood. The project had many reviews and editions. In 1811, after the influence of Prime Minister Spencer Perceval, one can notice two aspects. The first one being that there was a very substantial area of ground allocated to building compared with the first plan. The park was virtually a built-up area. The second one being that the pattern and distribution of the plan has close affinity with the planning of Bath by John Wood from 1727 onwards. Bath was the origin of the classic architectural revival to which any English architect would turn for ideas. It was Bath where the circus and the crescent had been first introduced, breaking with the relationship to streets and squares. The project was in its prime a London site in which people from the provinces expressed amazement and delight when they saw it. Regent's Park grew and as the designer intended, it fell short of an impressive unity. Spencer described the project in astonishment as if a unity in the character of the houses can be preserved so as to exhibit the entirety of a single building, its commanding situation will produce an effect of grandeur in the greatest degree striking. It will be the rallying point of the surrounding houses, emboldening them as one connected town and obtain the comfort of security in apparent neighborhood. Lawyer Crab Robinson predicted its effect on the country as, I really think this enclosure will give a sort of glory to the Regent's government, which will be more felt by remote posterity than the victories of Trafalgar and Waterloo, glorious as these are. The Prince Regent felt that his family and friends would wander homes looking directly onto the parkland and his palace. The final design was for a grand royal crescent with cream stucco facade and tall shut windows overlooking private gardens and the park. Under the Prince Regent's constant interference and changes, the royal crescent homes became larger and more opulent, resulting in significant budget overruns, which delayed the building program. In the March 1811 plan, the canal was incorporated into the project, however, in the Prince Regent's birthday on August 12th, the canal was opened as far as Hampstead Road due to the various monetary crises. A better start was made when the southern half of the proposed circus on the new road was taken on building lease by Charles Mayor, as Terence Davis states in his book John Nash, the Prince Regent's Architect. The plantations, only a few months old, were removed and houses began to rise at once. Unhappily, at the end of 1812, Mayor went bankrupt 
and a year of building was lost. It was not until 1815 when John Farquhar invested in the Syracuse and the project began to go forward. The crown eventually repossessed itself and in June 1819, the six houses that began with Mayor were finished and four others in progress. Around 1822, it was decided to abolish the north half of the circus in favor of a square, iron gates used to divide the crescent from the new road, and only Doric lodges remain today. Since ancient times, Greeks based their architecture on the post and beam system, which emphasized the pediment and the column as they were at human scale and symmetrical at the same time. Eventually, they were treated as a model, an arbitrary unit adopted to regulate the dimensions, proportions, or construction of the parts of buildings for all construction purposes. Throughout the classical era, Vitruvius, a Roman architect, wrote the Architectura, 10 books on architecture, recording the classical orders of architecture. Similarly, Andrea Palladio was a Renaissance architect who, as he concisely mentions in his Il Quattro Libri dell'Architettura, the four books on architecture, was highly influenced by Vitruvius. I always held the opinion that the ancient Romans, as in many other things, had also greatly surpassed all those who came after them in building well. I elected as my master and guide Vitruvius, who is the only writer on this art. This is why, throughout the designs of Nash, being influenced by both the Renaissance and the Hellenistic period, as well as his own exquisite mind, one can easily recognize perfect ratios, proportions, and geometry. Park Crescent was mathematically designed to comply perfect patterns and dimensions. In essence, it's the golden ratio the emblem that the building manifests the most. Even though the whole building design is composed by a pair of crescents, the elevation itself is composed by perpendicular and linear patterns, governed by an algebraic layout. Each terraced building component is constituted by 15 windows, three in each of its floors, matching as well the presence of the golden ratio proportions. The ionic simple theme of the design studied in the essay embodies porches resting in standing free columns. The same orders are applied throughout the project. The great curved colonnades support a wide balustrade balcony, which at the first floor is supported by an arcade frame by arched windows, the only decorative feature in the plain facades, which follow the same aesthetic in the second floor. The houses at the ends of each quadrant have pediments flanked by Greek antifaxi. The interiors of the houses were planned on traditional 18th century lines, as well as the successive villas and terraces in the park. The interior plaster work and the designs of the staircase, however, were determined by the preferences of the first tenants. The buildings were designed to be visually pleasing, to transmit its grandeur, by shaping its human interpretation, which was done within the usage of ratios, a revival technique taking us back to Vitruvius' time. Greek architecture, with its elaborate systems of optical corrections, was already ultimately refined for the pleasure of the eye. Architecture is a subject that reinvents itself within its evolution process. It forms part of society and its cultures, and therefore its role gets shaped within the changes of said human society. When human ideals and perceptions change influenced by a movement through time, it is the role of architects, then, to carry out the influence and reinvent the architecture of their age. This rebirth, however, seems to start from the same point always, ancient Greece, to the glory that was Greece and the grandeur that was Rome. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I hope you learned something new. Thank you so much for watching and see you in the next video. Bye!